Welcome back. We're going to take a look at part one of our lecture on introduction to heteroscedasticity. Uh, so we've got about 25 slides to go through in this part one. So let's take a look. heteroscedasticity. Uh, this is going to be part one of our discussion, so let's go ahead and get to it. Uh, so the first question, give ourselves a definition, right? Again, we've seen this before in the context of our Gauss-Markov classical uh, regression assumptions, uh, but technically it's a violation of the assumption of a constant error variance, right? So up to this point, we've been assuming that every observation has an error term that comes from an identical distribution, a mean of zero, a variance of sigma squared. What happens when that is not the case, when they have a mean zero, but that dispersion, that variability across samples differs by observation? That's our focus today. So our goals are to do list here uh, across at least two parts of these lecture videos. Uh, We'll dig into it, describe the problem, give ourselves a good proper definition. Uh, we'll think about what scenarios are going to be more likely to lead to this type of problem. Uh, so what are the different causes of uh, heteroscedasticity? And the big question is, why do we care? What are the implications of estimating a model that suffers from an, uh, a heteroscedastic error? And then how do you tell when that's the case? What are some ways of testing your OLS regression for the presence of heteroscedasticity? And when we inevitably find that that is the case, how do we fix it? How do we get valid results under this condition? So a good place to start, I think, um, is the the visual, right? So I, this is a great little uh, three-dimensional regression plot. Uh, I think I stole this out of the Wooldridge textbook, so credit where credit is due. Um, so basically what we have is a typical regression y versus x plot laid on its side, right? So we've got our y variable of wage versus x variable of education. And then playing the role of the third dimension here is the height of the probability density function for each observation. So what we're seeing, say for in this case, we've got a, an individual with eight years of education the point on the prediction line, right? That is our model's prediction for the average level of wage for an individual with eight years of education. And then that density function shows the variability across repeated samples for the outcome for the wage for an individual with, again, this particular level, eight years of education. And what we're seeing with this picture is that as education increases, yes, the average level of wage is predicted to increase as well. We've got that upward slope on our line, but we also see the dispersion, the spread of possible outcomes increasing. So this is the typical picture of a heteroscedastic model. As a given x variable goes up or down, the dispersion of those error terms goes up or down as well. In this particular case, x increasing, dispersion increasing, uh, as we'll talk about next, is going to be a very common scenario. Okay. So now let's move on to these kind of typical scenarios or causes of heteroscedasticity. So now we want to talk about these scenarios under which heteroscedasticity is more likely to be a problem, or kind of how to explain where this issue comes from. And the most common form of heteroscedasticity is what we'll call the scale or size or proportionality factor cause. Right? So the idea there is that we can sort our data, sort our observations by some measure of what we can think of as size or scale and observations that are quote unquote larger in size or scale are more likely to have wider variability. Okay. And we want to think about this typically in terms of our dependent variable. 
So imagine a case where we're trying to measure or predict total output, gross domestic product, across different countries. Right? Well, the variance of the error term is measuring, right, in dollar terms, how much variability we expect to see sample by sample by sample. Right? So think about the United States, right? So we've got $20 trillion of GDP. Obviously, the average variability that we would see is going to be much larger than a smaller economy with maybe $50 billion of GDP. So it, it, it's kind of built into the definition of the variable, that the larger the scale, the larger the variability. So any presumption of a homoscedastic constant dispersion error term is going to be highly unlikely. So that's kind of the, the first thing you want to do when you're considering this issue of, of heteroscedasticity is, is there a, a way in which my dependent variable can be ranked uh, or sorted by scale or size? And it doesn't have to be literal scale or size or even in dollar terms, but in, in some fashion, that's going to be likely linked to this variability in error dispersion. Okay. So another way in which heteroscedasticity can be kind of inserted into our, uh, our model is through the old problem of omitted variables. Right? So of course, when we think omitted variables, we think omitted variable bias. Right? So when we omit a variable, its influence, as we know, doesn't disappear. It's absorbed into the error term. Well, if the behavior of that omitted variable displays varying levels of dispersion, well, guess what? When you leave it out of the model, that behavior is going to be absorbed, taken up by the error term on top of the bias uh, in the coefficients that may be there as well. So that's the bottom line. Uh, if the variance of the omitted variable differs or changes across observations, then this misspecified error in the model that we are estimating incorrectly because we've omitted that variable will be heteroscedastic. So not that we needed it, but yet another uh, reason why we want to make sure we specify our model correctly. Uh, another form of heteroscedasticity is particular to time series data typically high-frequency time series data. And so this is something called the autoregressive conditional heteroscedasticity model, or the ARCH model. Now, we're not going to get into it here. It's, that's a whole other chapter uh, worth of material. Uh, but the idea simply is that the variability or the volatility of our dependent variable changes across time. So think about the stock market, right? The return on the S&P 500 day by day by day, you're going to go through periods of high volatility and low volatility. So again, the presumption of constant variability is going to be unrealistic at best. Uh, what the ARCH model does is imposes a specific functional form assumption onto this variability in volatility. And that idea that it's auto-regressive, today's volatility is a function of yesterday, or the lagged value of volatility. For our purposes right now, just think of this as a reminder that heteroscedasticity can come in any form of data. So that scale, size, proportionality way of thinking about it typically applies to cross-sectional data. This time-varying volatility, this arch process, would apply to time series data. So either way, you've got to worry about heteroscedasticity. Right? So now the question. We've kind of got the idea that no matter what type of data we're dealing with, we should be worried that we're violating this assumption. Now the issue, how worried do we need to be? What are the implications, what are the consequences of estimating our model with this violation? Ah, so here we have to go back to those derivations that we did under the Gauss-Markov assumption, right? 
I'm sorry, under the, the set of Gauss-Markov assumptions, we had a very particular formula that we derived for the variance of the OLS estimator, the variance of our B1 hat. And the way we got that formula to, to work is by imposing the assumption of a constant error variance. So once that assumption goes away, that whole derivation was incorrect. So the bottom line is the variance of the OLS coefficient estimator and everything that comes from that, the standard error, the T statistic, the P value, all of our hypothesis testing conclusions are now going to be entirely invalid. Okay. So if we go back and think about that derivation, we won't pick up and go through the whole thing right now, but if we go into the, the key element, right, where we had the variance of B1 hat, right, equal to the variance of our formula for B1 hat across samples, right? Remember, under the assumption that our X variable is fixed exogenous across repeated samples, we could pull that out of the variance operator and square it, right? So we get one over sum X minus X bar squared, all squared. And then we're kind of jumping into the derivation here where we have distributed that variance operator within our sum. And sorry, the sum should be across our in observations. So we get this term sum x minus x bar squared times the variance of ui. Right? So this worked out rather nicely under the classical assumptions, right? Because the variance of ui was equal to sigma squared for all i. So it was just a fixed value across observations in our sample. So we can make that substitution and then factor out the sigma squared out of that summation. This guy canceled one of those sum x minus x bar squareds in the denominator, and we ended up with our familiar formula here. And again, this is for the simple regression model with only one x variable. We could do exactly the same thing in a multiple regression model using matrices that comes out uh, in a very similar fashion. But the implication that we care about now is, well, if this sigma squared essentially doesn't exist, right, if each ui has a different value for that error variance, then this is where the, the derivation is going to stop. We can't factor out that constant. We can't cancel out the sum x minus x bar squared. So if our regression software is making calculations based on this formula, when in fact the error is heteroscedastic, it's going to give us all the wrong answers. Right? So number one, why do we care about heteroscedasticity? It invalidates our variance and our hypothesis testing for our coefficients. So what should the derivation look like under the more realistic and more more likely case of the variance of ui equaling sigma squared i so we make that one little tiny change we add that i subscript and it totally changes the result right so it's at this point right where the derivation kind of grinds to a halt and all we can do is substitute in the variance of our error term observation by observation, so it's within our sum, within that summation across our in observations, and this is what the formula really should look like. Okay. Depending on the nature of the, of the variables, depending on the variability in the sigma squared, the numerical estimate of this variance versus the, the standard formula could be very, very different. Right? So again, the bottom line, when we run our regression, our eyes always go right to the coefficient, the t-stat, the p-value, and we kind of start to make conclusions about what belongs in the model, what doesn't belong, what's significant, and what's not. Well, we have to really toss all that out the window until we establish whether or not our error term is heteroscedastic, whether we should be using the formula that's stata or R is giving us, or we should be making a different calculation. 
So those T stats, again, incorrectly calculated, hypothesis testing conclusions, invalid if we don't make a correction for heteroscedastis. Okay, that, again, by far our major concern here. Uh, another issue is that the OLS estimator will no longer be the efficient estimator. Remember we said under the Gauss-Markov classical assumptions, OLS was blue, the best linear unbiased estimator. Well, by best, remember, we meant most accurate, minimum variance, most efficient estimator. What we'll be able to show, not until part two, uh, is that we'll be able to get an estimator with a smaller variance, right? If we account for a heteroscedastic error. Okay. And again, we'll get into this uh, next time, but the basic idea is that we will be able to construct what we'll call our weighted least squares estimator, where we will weight the observations by their contribution to the error variance, essentially, right? So the larger error variances, and thinking about this as a proportionality type model, at larger values of x, right, so bigger country has a larger variability, that's going to create a larger dispersion of possible estimates across repeated samples, which is the dimension that the b1 hat variance is operating in. So if we can have an alternative estimator that puts less weight on those errors with larger variances, that'll give us a more compact distribution, a more efficient estimator. So again, the bottom line is standard operating OLS is going to give you incorrect calculations and less accurate estimation if the error is heteroscedastic. So again, something we need to pay attention to. Now for the good news, no matter how heteroscedastic your error is, you're not going to be introducing bias into the estimate of the coefficients themselves. Right? So OLS will still be an unbiased estimator. It's going to be it's going to be Lou, right? It'll be a linear unbiased estimator. It just won't be the best one. That's that's pretty good, right? Uh, and again, we could go back and redo the whole derivation, but we should recall that the the unbiased property, the unbiased result, critically depended on the assumption that our error term is uncorrelated with any of our exogenous, I should say, any of our uh, explanatory variables, right? So as long as we're not violating that, we don't need a constant error variance to get an unbiased estimator. So even if we have observations with much wider dispersion across repeated samples, as long as those, the centers of those distributions are at zero and they don't move up and down as X goes up and down, we won't have any systematic error away from that true regression slope. Okay, so that dispersion as we say here, still averages out right, over repeated samples. Okay, so now here's the fun part. You've got your data, you're running your regression, you've got it well specified, but now you need to know, can I trust these results? So we need to have a battery of tests, right, that we can apply to our regression results to get a, re a result of whether or not we have heteroscedasticity. So, as always, we like to start with just a visual inspection. So I call item number one on the list here the eyeball test. Just note that it's really not a test, right? We're not doing anything statistical here. We're just taking a look, right? And the key is know what to look for, right? So we'll go over that. And then the actual variety of statistical tests, we'll take a look at the Park test, the White test, and I think we'll get to that next time, the Bruch Pagan test. So what do we mean by the eyeball test here? Well, once we estimate our model, we want to generate a depiction of 
the volatility, the variability of our error term, the residuals, right? And look for any pattern that indicates a non-constant variance, where it's sometimes more volatile, sometimes less volatile, depending on either variation in time or variation in our x variables. As we know, with a homoscedastic, truly random error term, there should be no pattern involved whatsoever. So any pattern that you see in your residuals is an indication of some something has gone wrong. Okay. So what we're going to look at is a plot of the residuals themselves, the u hat, and for reasons that we will discuss in a second, the squared residual, each observation. Right, plotting those out versus a variable, typically an x variable that may be acting as this heteroscedasticity causal factor, the size or the scale or maybe the time element. Okay, so why do we use that squared residual? Well, basically what we're trying to do is capture an estimate of the variance of each observation's error term. In other words, we're trying to get a sigma hat squared that now is not constant. So you may recall the formula for sigma hat squared that we used before when we were just trying to get one number under the assumption that it applied to every observation. And it looked like this, right? So it was the sample variance of the residuals. So the sum of the squared residuals over our degrees of freedom, n minus k minus 1. And that worked relatively well, right? It was a, a consistent estimator for that constant variance. But as soon as we have a little i here, we need a value that changes each observation. And the best we're going to get, and there's some derivations that we could get into here uh, to show that this actually does make sense, but the best we're going to get is the squared residual for each observation. So acting as our proxy or our estimator for sigma squared i, or our sigma squared hat i, is the ui hat squared. That's a lot, a lot of stuff flying around there. Uh, so it's our squared residual for each, each observation represents the underlying dispersion. And the more you think about this, the less sense it makes, kind of, right? Uh, in that we're trying to capture, right, the shape of an entire distribution across repeated samples with just one observation. But the idea being the larger the size of the residual is, the larger, the farther from zero it is, more likely the more dispersed the more widely dispersed the underlying distribution is, the larger the variance is going to be. And so again, there is actually a, uh, a derivation that we could show that indicates this is a, a consistent estimator for the individual observation variance. Here we'll kind of rely just on that logic. Okay. So if we think about an example, right? So say we are estimating a model trying to predict individual level wage versus education and experience. So kind of the same idea that we saw with that three-dimensional plot, right? Following that regression, we are going to capture the residual. So in Stata, right, we'll use the predict command. We'll make up a name for the variable, call it u hat, call it res1, whatever you want to call it, comma resid. So you'll now have a new variable on your list of variables in Stata called res1. Uh, generate a new variable that's going to be the square of each observation. And then we can plot it out. So we can just use the scatter command, plotting the squared residual versus education. And basically what we're looking for is something like this, that if we estimated an, an, a regression, right, that we would get a slope to that estimated relationship. And it sure looks like it here, that as education rises, the average value of the squared residual rises as well, indicating greater variability, greater volatility of wage for those with higher levels of education. Everybody that, say, didn't finish high school is pretty well 
parked in this region here. But that variability markedly increases once we get past, say, education level 12. So if you wanted to have a mental image of what heteroscedasticity looks like in a data set, that's pretty much it. Right? Rising average size of errors as some factor, some X factor increases. So this would be failing the eyeball test, right? We look at that and say, oh, that looks heteroscedastic, heteroscedastic, right? Another thing we can do is simply plot the residuals themselves. So not the squared residuals, but just their level. And what we're looking for here is what we could call kind of an, an alligator mouth shape, right? Where it widens out as an X variable increases. That's the typical case. It could go up, it could go back down, it could start wide and, and decrease, but that classic scale factor uh, story is going to look something like this, right? Where we have kind of the, the range of values is going to be increasing as X increases. So again, these are the differences between predicted and actual values for each observation of wage, and those differences are much more widely dispersed at higher levels of education than at lower levels of education. Right? Uh, so state has this built-in command uh, that lets you do this real quickly. So the RVP plot, the residual versus predictor plot, so the predictor is just the X variable that we choose. So if you're not quite sure which or if any of your variables might be acting as this scale factor, you can cycle through them pretty quickly to get this, this visual, this eyeball test. All right, so now we've got the, the visual inspection down. Now we need some statistics to back up our conclusions. And the most intuitive test that we can use for heteroscedasticity is the so-called PARC test. And in a sense, we kind of already did this, right? When we made that first plot of the squared residual versus our X variable, and we said, well, gosh, if that slope is not zero, that would indicate heteroscedasticity, right? Well, the PARC test just says, well, let's just test that, right? see if we have a non-zero slope, a significant coefficient between X and our error variance estimator. Okay, so it starts out exactly the same way, right? The good news, we've already done the first step of the test. We've created the residuals, we've squared the residuals, right? And these are gonna act as our, again, our estimates, our proxies for that observation by observation error variance. And the test is whether or not a single suspect variable, in our example, education, but could be anything, right, is a significant predictor of changes in our estimated variance, our squared residual. Okay. So the only curveball, the only little uh, change that we have to remember is once we estimate our original model, so our generic model Y as a function of, say, X1 and X2, we get the residuals, we square the residuals, but then we run this test equation in a log-log nonlinear formulation. So the PARC test assumption is that it is a nonlinear relationship between the causal variable and the error variance. But the bottom line is the same. We want to know, is there a relationship? So it all comes down to this coefficient, call it this A1 coefficient in our test equation. If that term is not zero, if we can reject the null of zero, well then some variable, call it Z, can predict changes in the error variance, so the error variance can't be constant. We must have heteroscedasticity. So that's what it comes down to. The null is of a zero coefficient, meaning no heteroscedasticity. A rejection of that null indicates two things. Yes, you have a heteroscedastic error, 
and you also know at least one variable that's causing it, whatever we plugged into that equation. And again, the kind of the limitation of the test is that it's designed for one causal variable being tested at a time. So whatever z is, it's only one variable. If you wanted to test a different variable, you run a second test. So you kind of have to cycle through all of your potential causal variables to use this park test approach. But it's nice because A, it's real intuitive, real simple. It just comes down to a T statistic, right? Telling us whether that coefficient is significant. And it also gives you that second piece of information. You get the thumbs up or the thumbs down, plus what that causal factor is most likely to be. So a couple issues that we want to keep in mind here. Again, as we mentioned, in order to run the test, you really have to have an idea of what a likely causal variable is going to be. Otherwise, you're going to be, again, just trying every possible variable, which is not bad, right? You could do that, especially with a fairly limited model. Uh, but because it has that one variable at a time limitation. Okay. And then just a quick note on the notation here. In the, if I go back, in the equation, we have x1 and then an x2 predicting y, but we're calling the causal variable in the test equation z. And I know that's confusing. The point is that whatever we plug into that test equation, call it z, it might be x1, it might be x2, it might be some variable that's not even in the original equation. Typically it is, but just think of that as a as a bucket, right? So we can put whatever variable we want into that test equation, whether it's in the original model or not. And then again, on the plus side, if we reject the null, we get that second piece of information. We have a specific culprit, a causal variable in mind, and that's going to be really useful when we go to this the step of trying to fix the problem. If we have a good idea of what might be causing it, which variable might be causing it, That'll help us with that weighting scheme that we introduced a few minutes ago. So let's take a look and see what this comes out as in Stata. So following this same example, where we're trying to predict wage as a function of education and experience. And let's do this with a park test where we have education as our Z variable, as our suspected causal factor. We estimate the model. We capture the residuals. We square the residuals. Then we log the residuals. And sorry, on the slide, I left out that step. So this L U hat 2, that is our, and also excuse my penmanship on the mouse here, that is the log of our squared residual. So that would require another, there it is another generate statement in Stata. That's, that's our log of u hat squared as our dependent variable, and then we would have the log of our chosen variable, our z variable on the right-hand side. And all we need to know is, is this coefficient significantly different from zero? So we get a positive coefficient, t stat of 5.86, a p-value well below 0.01, so with over 99% confidence, 1% significance, we can reject the null that that coefficient is zero. And this lines up very well with that picture of the eyeball test, right? It looked like that slope was uh, positive, and it seems to be significantly positive in our example here. So again, big picture, as soon as you see this, as soon as you see this number right here, the p-value on the t-stat from a park test, Whatever you were looking at before in terms of the significance of education and experience on wage now gets thrown into uncertainty, right? We, don't, we know we can't trust those statistics, so until we fix it, we can't really draw any conclusions. So this is kind of a big moment in uh, the process of uh, empirical research, right? You run the regression to begin with, you say, okay, this is what it looks like in terms of my X affecting my Y, then you open up the hood and you start to look underneath and you say, oh, I can't really trust that until I deal with this issue. 
but nothing from the original regression would have told you that you had a problem. You had to know what to look for. And this is it. Okay, one more thing for our part one discussion here. Uh, that park test, like I said, real intuitive, nice and simple, gives you uh, valid results and good information. But the limitation can be a little bit limiting. You know what I mean? Uh, in that we have to choose a single variable to put into that test equation. Wouldn't it be nice if we could estimate a model that just gives you an answer of yes or no? Is there anything out there that seems to be causing heteroscedasticity or not? Well, that is the so-called white test approach, which looks at the joint significance of all of your variables in your model plus nonlinear combinations of those variables. So I like to say it casts a very wide net when looking for causes of heteroscedasticity. Okay. So it's a more flexible test equation and its default version includes all of our x variables plus every pairwise interaction amongst those x variables plus every square quadratic of those x variables. So, like I said, we're looking at every possible source just about of heteroscedasticity uh, in this test. So it's going to start out the same way as the park test and the eyeball test. We first run our regression. We capture the squared residuals. Right? We use the predict command to get our u hats. We use the generate command to get the u hat squared. And then we estimate our test equation. Note, unlike the park test, we don't take the log transformation. So the default is a linear assumption. And then if our original model had x1 and x2, our test equation model has x1 and x2 and x1 times x2, the interaction, and x1 squared and x2 squared. Again, just kind of throwing up our hands saying, we don't know where this might be coming from, so let's look for any, any significant effect. And the way to think about this is we don't really need to focus on any particular coefficient here. So with our two variables, we've got five terms in the test equation, five coefficients. And if any one of those coefficients, a1 through a5, is not zero, that is evidence of heteroscedasticity. Something over there is affecting our error variance. So we saw in the park test, we just needed to know if one coefficient was significantly different from zero. Now we need to know if we have one of five or one of a set of coefficients that's different from zero. So now we're going to trans transform from the t-test approach of a single coefficient test to an f-test joint significance approach. So the tools that we're going to use should be very familiar. Chapter 5 from Student Loot, right? The t-stat and the f-stat. We're just applying them to very particular test equations here. But that's the next step, is our null now lumps all of our coefficients together and tests whether or not they are all simultaneously zero, which is the condition that has to be met for us to say we don't have any heteroscedasticity. If at least one coefficient is not zero, if we find joint significance, that's enough to tell us we have a problem. We do have a heteroscedasticity problem. So we capture that F statistic, compare it to its critical value. If we reject the null, we know some combination of those terms is causing heteroscedasticity. So, again, some issues here. Start off with the, the good news, casting that wide net. You don't really have to think about this at all. You say, okay, whatever my regression is, let's throw everything in there and see what we get uh, in terms of our heteroscedasticity results. One limitation is, again, the default here, there's no Z, right? There's no kind of bucket that you could put any old thing into. So it limits us to uh, sources of variation within the original model. So X's that affect Y is where we will look for sources of heteroscedasticity. 
Okay. Occasionally, that can be a problem. Another issue is because of that wide net that we're throwing out there, uh, we're going to have potentially a lot of coefficients being estimated, right? So we saw in that previous example, when we started out with two x variables, we ended up with five coefficients estimated in the test equation. It's going to be an exponential increase, right? Because every variable that we add has to be interacted with every other variable plus the square plus the linear term. So what I'm getting at is we could be running out of degrees of freedom fairly quickly, right? So if you're at kind of the lower limit, say around uh, n minus k minus 1 of about 30 in your original equation, you might drop well below that really quickly and get uh, kind of invalid or questionably valid results with that small degrees of freedom in the test. There are ways around that where we might limit it. We might say, well, let's leave out the, uh, the interaction terms, maybe leave out the square terms. Our next test will give us another option there. And then lastly, unlike the park test, you get the thumbs up or the thumbs down, but you don't know exactly what the cause of heteroscedasticity is. It's not always going to be obvious which variable is going to be um, where you want to pinpoint it. So you can imagine the white and the park test being paired together rather nicely. You run your regression, you run the white test. If you fail the white test, now start to run a sequence of park tests, variable by variable, to see what the most uh, significant causal factor is. So what this is going to look like, in Stata, kind of doing it by hand, would look like this. Again, you run the original model, get the residuals, the u-hats, generate the u-hat squared, and then run this test equation just with the regress command again. And we've got x1, we've got x2, we've got x1 times x2, x1 squared, x2 squared. So these have been kind of pre-generated squared and interaction terms in this example. And then what's the one piece of information we want to get out of this? It's going to be right here, right? Remember, every time we estimate an OLS equation, Stata, very conveniently, automatically generates the F statistic applied to the joint significance of all the variables in the model, which is the exact white test statistic that we need. So here we get an F stat of 11.94, and there's that p-value, zero out to four decimal points, highly significant, well beyond 1%. So we know at least one thing in that list is causing heteroscedasticity, is associated with changes in the error variance. So we've got some, this is why I chose the example, uh, but we've got some pretty consistent results, right? The eyeball test didn't look good. The park test, that one variable we, we tried, we immediately found significant heteroscedasticity, and the white test tells us the same thing. Uh, now, there is a way to do this in uh, Stata without doing all this extra work. Um, I'm going to prefer us not to do it that way, at least for now, um, because it's going to generate, instead of our familiar F statistic, it's going to generate a chi-square Lagrange multiplier test statistic that uh, we may have not have covered at this point. Uh, but if you want to go that route, um, you can use the ESTAT IM test comma white. The general formulation is going to be much of what we saw here. But I like to just get in there and do it by hand and generate that F statistic. And there it is. One way that we can save a little bit of time uh, instead of generate, especially with a large model, instead of generating every square and every interaction, uh, A, we could use the, uh, the built-in Stata interaction uh, term, the, the hashtag combining of variables, but especially if you have a, a fairly large K, a large number of variables, you can run the model, generate the predicted value of the dependent variable, the Y hat, and then square it, right? Because think about what information is going to be in y hat squared. If y hat is that linear combination of x1 and x2, well, squaring it, it's going to have x1 and x2, but also x1 squared, x2 squared, and x1 times x2. It's going to have all the information that we need by adding in that y hat squared to our model. 
And if that term is significant, that's the same as failing the white test. So that's a little bit of a shortcut. Again, I would probably prefer just to see it piece by piece like this. But if you've got 20 different variables, this was definitely a viable shortcut. Okay, so we'll pick up here next time, look at one more test approach, and then see how to generate valid results, fix the problem of heteroscedasticity. Thanks.